Welcome to The God Room with Danny Hobble. Danny's art ministry has touched millions of people around the world. For the past four decades, Danny has shared his talent by spreading the Word of God through art. Join us now as Danny shares his inspiration behind the talent in The God Room. Hi, welcome to The God Room with Diana and myself. I'm Danny Hobo. Um, today I'd like to take you maybe on a journey on how all this God Room started. Um, again, like I mentioned in the beginning of the broadcast, when you see this, uh, the God Room is not really a room per se. It's not like a, um, uh, a shrine or something, you know, with a whole bunch of statues and beads and all this kind of stuff. Um, the God Room is really just a quiet space alone with God. Again, you got to have a God Room as you're walking down a path of woods or your God Room could be in the car as you're driving someplace where it's just you and God. Wherever it's just you and God and you spend a long time with the Lord, that is your God Room. Um, we have a, a, our own God Room kind of set up. It's just um, a place out in Hawaii. It's just outside the house where there's no phones, there's no uh, computers, uh, you don't have kids running around, whatever. It's just real quiet time, which is, you know, for us, is outside on our back porch, Lanai. And uh, that is our God room. But a lot of times, again, you know, I might be driving in a car, and at that point, that's my God room. It's just your alone time with God. And he showed me the importance of that right after my operation. And that's kind of what I wanted to get into today, was is to walk you through a little bit of that, to show you just how good our God is and how wonderful that he really is. I mean, when we, when we started, actually just, just before uh, the operation uh, took place. Which was uh, about our, two years ago. Yeah, about yeah. two years ago. Um, you know, we were having some, some financial difficulties. And it was, it was like we barely could keep our head above water. And as a matter of fact, the place that we were staying in, um, it, our finances got so low we couldn't afford it anymore and so we were kind of forced to move and through the whole thing um, we kept praying I mean I know you know you were praying about it and I was praying about it and it just seemed like the more that we prayed it seemed like the lower my finances were getting you well, know you we, we were praying for provision and praying for business to improve and all the things that you would naturally think would be the way to pray. Right. But like you said in the past, that you did always say, Thy will be done. So this is a pathway that he, the Lord took us down of Thy will be done. So it was his, his way of maneuvering things to get something much better out of the situation. Well, what, and, and that's true. But what we didn't realize was the fact that as we were praying, because we were... You know, when, uh, kind of like what, what, what my wife was saying, um, you know, in the normal we think, oh, if you're low on finances, yeah. you pray for more finance because that's what you need. And the more we were praying, you know, God help us, God was saying, oh, okay, mm -hmm. and he took more finances away, not knowing what his goal was. Mm -hmm. And the more we prayed, our finances got worse and worse and worse. And so, you know, it crossed my head. I don't have a cross stewards, but it crossed my head at one point where I just said, you know, I don't know if I want to pray anymore about it. Because it seems like the more I was praying, the worse it was getting. So, you know, I, I just don't want to pray anymore about it. Yes, and, and I saw you get discouraged. You, yeah. You really hit a low there of discouragement, and you had a battle going on, and during that time, you know, of prayer, I think was when you began to truly surrender it to God. Yeah, and like I say, you know, it, it got to that point to where, you know, I was, I was just saying, well, I don't even know if I want to pray anymore. And I guess it was the Holy Spirit's conviction that was just saying more or less like, you sure you want to do that? You know, and I got to think about it, it's like, no, I've been down that road before. Yeah. I mean, I've been walking with the Lord for like 40 years, and I've messed up quite a lot. And I've been down that road before where I just said, okay, fine, God, you don't care, I don't care, and walked away. And it never turned out to be good for me. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I got spanked and smacked around until yeah, I finally came back to submission. There was submission. a time where God or the Holy Spirit was bringing you to a place of confirming your faith. And our faith mm -hmm. can't truly get confirmed until we hit a time in our lives where we need to truly, all the things we've told other people, well, they're in a hard position, yeah. and it was so easy for us to give them the advice of just pray, just have faith. Well, God brought us to a, co a crossroad, and during that time, your faith was confirmed. And I know you well, want to talk about that. Yeah, and you know, that that is one thing that, you know, as, as, as Christians, you know, we know the Bible, we hear sermons every week, and it's like, you know, we know what to say, we know the right thing to do, and it's easy to tell other people. It's even easier to tell ourselves, oh, we need to pray more, whatever. But when you're faced with situations, when the rubber meets the road, as they said, mm -hmm. you know, that's the true test of, well, where is your faith at? And I was at that crossroads, and the one Bible verse that hit me was uh, in Job 13, 15, where it says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I just couldn't get away from that verse, and, it, and I said, Well, Lord, I'm going to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to cling on to that, and that's what we need to do. You know, is we got to hold on to God's promise and say, I'm going to hold on to this promise, and, you know, if my finances fall and we just get thrown out on the street, so be it, but I'm going to hold on to that and continue to pray. Mm -hmm. And it was right after that we made that commitment and said, we're standing fast and we're standing on God's word that he's going to take care of us. I don't care what the situation is. Then all of a sudden things started happening. You could start off with that. Well, you, your first thing was meeting. Then the next day you had that meeting well, of the I church had, meeting. I had uh, met Patrice probably a month before that. And uh, we had a woman's Bible study at our church and one day the uh, leader of our Bible study Oneida decided to pair us up and we were to go somewhere with a, a certain person and talk about the needs of each other and pray for each other because she wanted us to grow and I did not know Patrice personally but she picked Patrice and during that time we had a, a bonding time and we truly became sisters in the Lord mm. in an intimate way of, of two you know, you're talking about God time in the God room. Okay, we had a, a place there in the sanctuary where we had our God time together as sisters. Okay. And there was a oh, connection cool. that was made right there in prayer. Because I wasn't used to praying for someone out loud. And at this time, I had to yield and truly feel her need. And she had to yield and, and, and feel mine and, and pray. So during that time... I think God really, you know, inspired us to become close friends. And uh, over the course of time, uh, when she began to hear about the problems we were having, she told me about experience that she had had, that the Lord sent her to Florida. She had lived in uh, Massachusetts. The Lord sent her to Florida specifically to help three men, and it would be three veterans. And the Lord had already provided the two, and she, God gave her the names. And she had already he had met those needs with two other people. And the last one on the list was Dan. <laughs> Dan. Is this remarkable? This is how God so, works. You know, so she was a very qualified in everything that has to do with uh, Social Security programs, veterans programs, everything for the needy. So she told us about a program that she was certain that you would qualify for. And... Um, so we looked in that and we got the name of the Social Security, you had a person of contact and we called her that day and she had a meeting, there was a meeting set up for the, the next day and asked if we could come to that meeting to see if we would qualify for special assistance for veterans who are about to be evicted. So we went the next day and at that meeting we were approved and not only approved but we received the last voucher that was given in that program for that entire year now the remarkable thing is say this whole process we're talking about government this takes months at least six months for all this to happen we had it happen one day after another what was it within three days we had our voucher yeah. that never happens that takes at least six months to nine months 
if you get it mm -hmm. and we were the last ones that was left on that slot to get it right after we got ours they shut the program down they no longer have it yeah i mean this is how god works it's just you know it, he had all this lined up all he needed was for us to say, I'm standing with you, God. Yeah. And then you could see God roll up his sleeves yeah. and say, okay, let's get to work. And this is what he was doing. Yes, and it was a housing voucher. So according to your income is what you had to pay each mm -hmm. month. So God provided us a new place to live, which we would have never chosen on our own. Yeah. And the, the rent that we paid was so low, it, it was it was totally God. It almost laughable. It, it really was. was. So he moved us from uh, Northport to Punta Gorda, and this is something we had never planned on. We would have never planned to move to Punta Gorda. That was farther away from our church and our family and our friends. Mm -hmm. We would have never picked a second story unit because my husband had problems walking. But there was one unit left that day in yep. that particular. Uh, division and that was exactly where our meeting was our meeting to get our voucher was in that place yeah in that, so in that complex when yeah. we walked in and we saw the apartment we knew that we were supposed to be there and it did not make sense to us because it really was not something we would have chosen yeah. but we knew the Lord was in it and we said yes right then we moved in we set up the business there and and from that point on we began to understand why we were there when you became ill. Well, and, and that's true. I mean, all, all this was, was setting up us to be in the exact spot that we needed to be for, again, future stuff that God knew about that we did not know about. Mm -hmm. When I moved in there, um, I was having problems with my leg. I couldn't work just quite right. So, again, like we were saying, having stairs was really not an option. We would never pick that. Um, there's a lot of things we would have said no to in our head, mm -hmm. but both of us knew within our, our the spirit that this was home. So we grabbed it. Right. And it was like shortly right after we got into that thing that um, I got what they call uh, diverticulosis. Say, diverticulosis. I can never say this thing right. Um, and it's a really bad, um, it's an intestinal thing that bursts open and you know all sorts of well, stuff. Well the complications stuff. Go from ahead. the diverticulitis is what happened. You didn't know you mm. had it or you would have eaten different but yeah, we thought it was the stomach flu and... Yeah well, I mean I was feeling bad yeah. and you know I just thought well you know it's just a stomach flu or whatever it was and um, usually they say once it bursts open once you have that and it starts that you're supposed to be in the hospital within 24 hours well, and what happened we was, waited about a week. We thought you had the stomach flu, so yeah. we thought the normal process of the vomiting and everything, that it would go away, you stopped eating everything. Yeah. So then your symptoms actually kind of got better because there was nothing in your system. Until one night, I looked at your mm -hmm. stomach and there was a protrusion. Your stomach was elevated at a certain point, and I'm like, oh my gosh, something's wrong. This yeah. is not the stomach flu. So you called VA that night, they said to get to the emergency room right away yeah and I mean you know it up to this point I felt bad and it hurt um, actually the doctor told me that I have a really very high tolerance for pain which I didn't know but if they said normally mm -hmm. a lot of people would have been crawling on the floor I was bad but wasn't that bad um, but it got to the point right at the same time you were seeing this protrusion that I mean I just got uh, the pain was just so bad it's like okay so I got to take care of this somehow because mm -hmm. this is not going to just pass away and we did we made an appointment uh, to go see the, the doctors and uh, they brought us in right away and here's the amazing thing now when again you know it was amazing that God made all this happen for us to go to this one spot this one, one particular one place this this place um, and he made it all happen within days that usually takes months and then right after that is when I had this problem with the diverticulosis and we were only what two about two blocks, about two or three two blocks, blocks from a major or um, uh, a a hospital that's in Florida that specializes in things like diverticulosis. Well, it was the doctor. <laughs> we found well, the, out yeah, the doctor that the doctor there. was the number one leading doctor in this illness and in the surgery department. So, Two blocks away. That's that. I mean, God, the thing was, was crazy. when you went in, 
you should have been dead. And, yeah. and when they looked at you and they found, they could not believe you were alive still. They said it had burst at least a week ago. And the doctor came in and I knew it was serious. Mm. But on the way to the operating room, I was, uh, I was wheeling my husband down and I'm trying to hold on to faith. We went by the chapel, and when I turned and looked in the chapel, mm -hmm. there was one of my husband's paintings on the chapel wall. And right when I needed help and I needed faith, I saw that painting, which was called The Power of Prayer, and I saw it on the wall, and I knew at that point that my husband was going to be okay, because he was exactly where God had ordained him to be at the time that he needed to be, and God himself was going to take care of my husband. I should have been frantic and worry, and I had a peace come over me, you know, as they wheeled you into the operation, which was three hours long, was very dangerous. The doctor could not believe, you know, when he came in after, then the seriousness of it, he explained to me more that you shouldn't be alive, that what they found in there was, you know, a, a grapefruit size abscess that should have killed you a long mm -hmm. time ago. So, but, you know, God put us in the hospital. He put us in the, in the hands of a surgeon that was expert in that area. If you'd have went to another hospital, they would not have had that expert. Yeah. You probably would have died, you know. But Yeah. And that and, was and a, a point of change for you. Uh, well, you became closer to the Lord during Yeah, this. and, I mean, you know, I mean, again, right after that, um, you know, I'm waking up into the into the the hospital room there and of course I had a lot of questions for God um, and one of them of course was the fact that you know I'm hearing all these doctors and you know I could hear them even though I was in the room I could hear them outside of my room I don't think doctors think that you can actually hear them because the conversations they were having you know, I probably shouldn't have been privy to and a lot of it was the fact that you know I can't believe he's still alive he's, you know that, uh, that kind of thing and, you know, I'm listening to all this, and so I'm asking God, I'm going, well, why then, Lord? You know, I mean, I'm 60-something years old. I had a good life. I did a lot of, you know, things for the Lord. I mean, I used the talent that he gave me for, you know, for him or whatever. And it was like, you know, well, I don't understand, Lord. You know, why did, why did you spare my life? I'm happy, but, you know, there's something more. And... Basically, what I was getting from him, which is where this God room thing started, was the fact that he was telling me that, okay, for those that don't know me, um, I've been painting for the Lord now for like 40 years, years, okay, and it's all like Christian works, and there's like hundreds of them out there, and there's all over the world, and Footprints in the Sand, and a whole bunch of them that, mm -hmm. you know, people know, and so it's been... I've been working for the Lord and getting, you know, doing all that. And I'm thinking, I'm in good with God, if you will. You know, I'm really doing what He wants me to do. And what all this was done, He was just telling me, basically, He was saying, you know, all that's nice and good, and I, you know, it, it's great, but that's not what I hunger for. This is God speaking. Mm -hmm. And God was telling me what He hungers for is a close relationship with us. Mm -hmm. Now I had a relationship with him, but it was at my convenience. You know, when I wanted to be alone with God, then I went and got alone with God. Mm -hmm. And then when I was done, I got up and walked away and lived my own life. Not that I, you know, and, did the other stuff, but... The experience you had about being sold. Oh yeah, well, and, and that's what he told me there when I was in this question saying, what's, you know, what's going on? And he was telling me, he says that, he, he, told, he told me this way, he says, you were sold, but you were not sold out. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was, you know, when, when I heard that, it was like, well, I don't understand, yes, well, what you do you mean? you were sold, you were painting for me, you did works for me, yeah. you did all the right things that, in man's eyes and even in what you would thought would be God's eyes. But there was an intimacy level that God was wanting from you. It was as if, oh, yeah, look I, that, what you did. I've got something so much more. Come on into the God room with me, you know. Well, and, and this is what he was saying when he said you, you were sold, but not sold out. And I said, well, what does that mean? 
he was saying you were sold on jesus christ and mm -hmm. you know, i accepted the lord and i believe that he was my savior is my savior and that i will you know go to heaven be with him someday so i was sold on christianity and jesus christ i was sold mm -hmm. but i wasn't sold out and being sold out means all of a sudden now it's like like the bible says you know your life is no longer your own mm -hmm. it's not it's bought and paid for by jesus christ and you know you now um do the lord's will and in that way and have that intimacy with and him i like an experience that you conveyed to me about the extension on your life that god was giving you an extension it wasn't to start over but that oh, he yeah. was giving you an extension on your life to do his work, to do his will in your family, to finish the intimate yeah. works, the intimate things of relationship with your sons and with your family, yeah. and it still had to do with the intimacy, even with your family members and your sons, but it was the extension of life that he gave you. Well, and that's true, and the whole thing of, you know, for me to now do what the Lord, why he's given me that extension, mm -hmm. um, is through the God room, through having the quiet time alone with God. Because a lot of times when we have, you know, time with, with the Lord and we pray, mm -hmm. what do we do? We, we, we come to the Lord, we say, oh Lord, you know, I need help in, you know, um, for my son, or I need help with my finances, yada, yada, yada. And when we're done asking for what we want, then we get up and we go. And God's going, well, wait a minute, where's mm -hmm. my turn to respond? You know, and when you have that quiet alone time, you know, a lot of times in there, it's just sitting quietly before the Lord, like the Lord says, you know, be quiet and know that I am God. And you have, you be still before the Lord mm -hmm. and then he can come in and talk, but you have to be completely still yeah, because, you know, if, if you're not, we have all that monkey chatter, we won't hear what God's got to say. You have to completely wipe it all out and just wait upon the Lord. And he will give you the answers, and that's what we're at. Yeah, and I think a lot of your life you had many struggles and many battles that you went through. And because you might not have had the intimacy or spent the alone time with God, a lot of those battles you fell over. I mean, you, you, you yeah. had good times, but you had a lot of times you did not have the strength to overcome some situations in your life. And that's what God is wanting to bring us to, a place where... We spend time with Him so that He can begin to change our nature to be more like His divine nature. And so that we have the ability and we have the power and, and the excitement and the, and the love that we can overcome the battles and the situations. So He was setting you up for a greater victory than you had ever had yet. Yeah. Through the intimacy, not by works, not by painting, yeah. but by the quiet intimate prayer time that you had and you know that that has I've seen a great change in you since all of this occurred and you know the thing is you know we are we're all the same because we're all in Christ yeah. so what he's done for us he is willing to do for you as well and you just have to have your quiet alone time in your God room mm -hmm. with the Lord There's nothing more important in life than your personal relationship with God. Nothing.